Hey guys, you are watching your anime world, how are you all? Please support to subscribe this channel for watching new interesting stories so in this video, we will see what if Deku was All Might's hidden legacy. Here is short summary, TEP into the world of MHA, as we put a slight twist on the story and look at how the world is changed by it. See how the world's symbol of peace and justice deals with a reality he never expected and how Izuku learns a truth his mother hid from him. How a relationship 14 years ago led to the start of our story, how the son of the symbol of peace and justice was born. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Back Alley Street, Tokyo, Japan 15 years ago, late November. Give me your wallet. The thug flicked his hand up his quirk turning it into a blade that pressed against the man's neck drawing blood, or I'll gut you. Please I don't have anything on me, the man trembled as he pulled out his empty pockets showing he had nothing on him, they are in my car. I forgot them that's why I was here trying to cut back to the paw. Shut up. The thug pressed his blade hand into the man's neck even harder, well it looks like this isn't your night. The thug moved to press his bladed hand fully into the man's neck and then go elsewhere to look for another target. He had a representative to maintain and a quota to meet, if he didn't have his boss's cash on time it would be him dead in a gutter somewhere. Besides a little blood on his blade would work wonders motivating the unlucky souls that came across him for the rest of the night. It's fine now, do you know why? The booming voice caused the both men's eyes to widen one in hope the other in despair as the thug and his bladed hand disappeared from view, because I am here. Crash. The man's whose life had just been about to end could only blink and then look up in awe as All Might the All Might appeared in front of him. The criminal that was about to take his life was about hundred meters away laid out on the cold ground a set of trash cans having stopped him from going further. The man's eyes however immediately shot back to All Might who towered before him his signature smile on his face as he also glanced down and saw the number one hero wasn't wearing his iconic costume but a very nice shirt and trousers with a long red tie as well. Thank you, thank you. The man started to bow to All Might so vigorously that the pro hero was sure the man was going to pull something. All Might opened his mouth to insist that the man need not thank him and ask if the man was okay if he needed any more help. However just as he was about to another voice ran out in the alley. You have a reminder, you have a reminder, you have a reminder. All Might's famous smile stayed plastered on his face although his eyes widened slightly as the two men stood awkwardly for a moment as All Might's own voice sounded from his pocket. All Might let out a slight cough as he lifted up a hand with a raised finger asking for a minute which the man he just saved nodded awkwardly. The man would have laughed if the scene before him was anyone other than All Might as suddenly the behemoth of a man suddenly turned around and seemed to curl up as he took his phone from his pocket. All Might silenced the reminder that was still yelling out his voice as he read the reminder and several text messages that he had missed. Oh shoot, Toshinori cursed in his head. Not only had the 14 reminders he had set not to miss this meeting had passed, but the one he had just seen was the last so he officially had only 5 minutes to get there before he was late and then there were the texts. The person he was set to meet was already there and waiting for him at the time he had insisted that they arrive. This meeting was probably the most important one of his life so far and its outcome could affect everything for years to come. He looked at the time and although he was cutting it tight with his enhanced speed he could make it to the meeting on time if he left now, he quickly sent a text to his sidekick Mirai to send police to this location to pick up the criminal he had stopped. Apologies citizen but I am needed elsewhere. All Might turned back to the man he had just saved and then to the mugger he had knocked out. I have alerted the authorities and they shall be here shortly. Oh of course. The man gave another bow to the pro hero, thank you again and good luck not that you need it. All Might gave the man a wave as he leapt into the air and started racing as fast as he could to get to his meeting on time that was on the other side of the city. He had planned on arriving early so that he could get everything sorted for tonight but like as always whenever he made plans they went off the rails the moment he heard a cry for help. He would never regret answering but it did sometimes make things complicated like tonight he had ended up responding to a dozen incidents that had taken him clear across the city. So a 10 minute drive from Might Tower with plenty of time to spare had turned into trying to race back, 
Normally he would just cancel whatever plans he had made but tonight was rare expectation. No tonight has to happen, I can't cancel, not this. Toshinori stayed firm in his commitment he would be at this meeting no matter what. I can still make it, as long as nothing else hap. Help, help. Toshinori stopped in his tracks, his head snapping towards the direction the cries for help were emanating from. His body reacted before his mind could even think about it as he pushed off and headed directly to where he was needed. As he arrived he could see the person shouting, it was a small car collision and one of the passengers was stuck as their vehicle filled with smoke. He leapt down and rushed to help, his arrival causing shouts of joy and cheers from the bystanders. As he easily pulled the door off and recused the trapped motorists his eyes glanced up to a nearby clock showing that he was now late. Okay not great but I'm sure if I push myself I can get th. Hey stop thief, someone help. All Might's head snapped as he heard another cry for help his enhanced hearing picked up not two blocks away just as he placed the recused motorist. Two blocks in the wrong direction, he resisted sighing in public instead just kept his signature smile on his as he quickly made sure the motorist was fine and first responders were on the way before he rocketed back into the air. His eyes quickly saw the petty thief running down the street, cash falling from the bundles in his hands, he was no master criminal. The thief's quirk seemed to be a rather simple one that just made him faster than normal if the speed he was going at was any indication but he was still no match for the speed one for all gave all might. Right stop this guy turn him over to the cops and I am sure I will only be a few minutes late tops. Two hours and sixteen saves later, including one actual cat stuck in a tree. All might landed with a slight thud in the alley just across from his meeting place his hand shooting to his phone to look at the time and hoping there wasn't a string of scathing text messages from the person he was meeting. Holding on to the vaguest smallest simple hope that the time wasn't as late as he thought it would be. It wasn't more worryingly there wasn't a single text message beyond the first ones he received telling him that they were waiting for him. I'm so dead, he felt the large beep of sweat form and drip down the side of his head. Toshinori laid out a deep breath as he turned off one for all the physical change occurring immediately as his muscles and size decreased. However, as he spotted his reflection in a nearby window as crossed the street he could see the change was only negligible at this point, his body had adapted so well to one for all that at this stage he couldn't really turn it off his muscle form as he called it even when he tried. However, it was still good enough that Toshinori Yagi and All Might weren't immediately recognized as the same person by the majority of people, allowing him rare moments out of the limelight. As he moved towards his target the restaurant that had a large fancy sign out the front that read, Ueda's place, he took another deep breath and checked he still had everything he needed on him. The restaurant was one of the most exclusive and high-end in the city, usually, it took months to get a seat but Toshinori had for the first time used his position as the number one hero to jump the queue. He wasn't exactly proud of it and still felt awkward but tonight was too important. The restaurant's strict code of privacy was exactly what this meeting required, so he didn't feel too guilty. The hostess greeted him as Toshinori not All Might her eyes gave a quick frown no doubt wondering who he was and why All Might had called in a favor to get this person and his guest a table for tonight. She guided him first to an elevator and then to the best seat in the house, located on their rooftop dining area right next to the edge that gave the best view of Tokoyo, he paused and let out a breath he hadn't realized he had been holding. She was still here, seated at the table he had reserved was the woman who for the past few years had occupied his every thought when he was not working. As she turned to face him he felt his breath and heart stop for a moment as his deep blue eyes connected with her impossible large and circular pools of emerald green. She gave him such a smile that if could capture this moment and hold it in his head he would be a happy man for the rest of his life. Inko Haikatsuga, he spent a few moments looking at her. She was wearing a tasteful sleeveless green dress that hugged her slim figure perfectly and stopped at her ankles. Her straight shoulder length dark green hair was tied into its usual style with the small and spiky ponytail at the back, which always thought looked the same as Nanashimura's hairstyle. However, he quickly dispelled the thought of his old mentor as he shook himself out of his haze and moved to the table thanking the hostess before sitting down. As she left to give them a few moments to decide on drinks and a meal, he saw her raise a slight eyebrow at the couple, and he knew why. It was the age difference. 
Although he knew he looked good for his age there were still 14 years between himself and the 24-year-old Inko, and no amount of healthy living could hide the age difference. It was one of only three things in their relationship that gave him pause, every time they went somewhere someone always raised an eyebrow or whispered about them. However, out of all of his concerns, it was the lowest on his list. He knew it didn't look great and some people thought it unseemly to date someone over a decade younger than you but it had never phased Inko. The one time he had brought it up early in their relationship she had laughed, made a witty joke, told him he was being stupid and shouldn't let others dedicate his life and that was that. The concerns that gave him serious pause however were to start with the second on his list was that he was technically her boss. Inko worked in the accounting department at the Might Tower and was very good at her job from what he understood. He said technically he was her boss because Inko worked for a subagency contracted by the Hero Public Safety Commission, whose job was to monitor pro-heroes like All Might's expenditure to prevent misappropriation or insufficient funding. However, whenever he made the I'm only technically her boss argument in his head it sounded pretty flimsy and something he made up to avoid the awkwardness of seeing someone under him. He was sure the only reason Inko was comfortable around him was part of the main reason he was concerned about pursuing a relationship, she doesn't know I'm all might. They had met a few years ago when Inko had first taken up the job with the finance subagency at the Might Tower. She had bumped into him as Toshinori in the tower's cafeteria whilst looking for a seat near the windows wanting a good view of the city she had just moved to and found the only table with a spare seat next to a window was his. He sat in the cafeteria as Toshinori as a way to keep grounded and get to know the people who worked so hard so he could do his job. His sitting next to a window was so that he could always keep an eye on all the townspeople and watch out in case he was needed, which resulted in him rushing out in the middle of lunch more than once. Inko was the first person ever to ask to sit with him, as despite his intention of getting to know people the rest of the staff avoided him. Inko later told him it was because they knew he worked on the top floor something she only learnt about three months of sitting with him for lunch. The staff knew he worked on the executive level and although no one had connected him to All Might they all thought he was some sort of high-powered executive. So they had avoided the strange, well-built tall man in his nice shirts that constantly rushed off to what they guessed were important meetings, according to Inko some thought he was All Might's personal assistant. So he had to eat lunch alone, well until a young new starter who apparently didn't know better had sat down. He was also aided by the fact that unlike every other pro-hero, his real identity wasn't a matter of public record and was only known to a handful of highly trusted people. He had spent a lot of energy keeping Toshinori out of the limelight and public records largely to make it harder for all for one to track him down. So to Inko he was just Toshinori Yori, a man that worked in the same building as her, in a some position on the upper floors and who she had developed a relationship with despite his best attempts to avoid it. He wasn't sure how it had happened but he had ended up in the last place he had ever thought he would. A nice one of lunch had turned second one, then into a nice lunch every day, followed by exchanging numbers, then texting and calling each other after a rough day, then meeting outside of work to relax, a few nice dinners together to say thank you, then a secret trip together you know for fun, then one night after a very late dinner he spent the night at hers and suddenly he was in a relationship. He had tried to end it, he knew he should end it, being with him was dangerous, his mentor's life had shown him how dangerous a family could be in this life. He had kept this under the radar from everyone, no one knew about him and Inko, she had even come up with a fake boyfriend Hisashi Midoriya that she used to explain her trips and their dates to her friends. He hadn't asked her to do that, but Inko being Inko had figured out that he needed to keep their relationship on the sensitive side and so came up with the fake boyfriend story, without ever asking why. It was the type of person she was, putting someone else's needs before her own without needing to know the reason. He suspected she thought it was because of company policy about inter-office romances and dating a subordinate, she had even stopped their public lunches together to prevent water cooler gossip. However, every time he worked up the nerve to end it, all the reasonable arguments logged in his head, he just had to see her and they all went away. It was her smile, her laugh that kept him from ending it but most importantly it was the simple fact that at the end of the day, it was her he wanted to see. Whereas before his goal of being the symbol of peace had been just to make the world a better place, he was now striving for the goal harder than ever before, 
for her, so she had a peaceful world to live in. Looking at her for the first time since setting himself on this path, the long road to make the world a better place to create a place where everyone could smile, he wanted just one thing for himself. Toshi, as Inko said his name he felt all his worries melt away as she looked at him with those eyes he could lose himself in. What happened to your shirt? Huh, Toshinori blinked looking down he saw that his nice freshly ironed shirt was now raggedy, spotted with several stains, his tie was gone and now he thought about it he had had a jacket as well, where had that gone? He let out an awkward chuckle thinking that maybe the hostess's frown at the entrance at the door and raised eyebrow wasn't at the age difference but at his nearly disheveled appearance. He looked back up at Inko who was just smiling at him, her emerald green eyes twinkling with mirth at his unkempt state, which had been a running theme for most of their dates. He found himself smiling now, she was truly something else, he was over two hours late and she didn't even care as long as he did turn up. I ran into someone wh. Who needed help? Inko finished his sentence for him with a large smile, knowing what he was going to say as it had become his catchphrase between the two of them. Well, I've heard worse excuses. Toshinori responded with his own smile, at her witty remark as she opened her menu which he knew she had already looked at and was ready to order but wanted to give him time to decide. He didn't need to apologize for being late, I never do with her, his smile turned tender at that thought. The first time he ran late he had said the line about helping someone and apologized, at which point Inko had told him never to apologize for taking the time to help someone in need. He couldn't stop himself from glancing up at her as he looked over the menu himself and once they had ordered their meals they fell into their natural flow. As they chatted about work, well Inko chatted and Toshinori asked questions or made comments as she talked about the slight drudgery of looking at numbers all day the latest gossip her colleagues told her and the fact she had taken up sewing. Toshinori took it all in as they tucked into their meals, laughing a little as Inko poked fun at his meal which his fitness-obsessed nature made sure was as healthy as possible, whilst she tucked into her plate of katsudan. As they finished their meal, Inko took a sip of the glass of water she had ordered and looked out at the view of Tokyo at night, he took a deep breath deciding that he had put this off long enough. Inko Toshinori felt his smile somehow widened as she looked back to him curiosity present as she noticed his unusual softness and slight timidness, there's something I've been meaning to tell, I've been meaning to do for a long time actually and, well, I hope this doesn't lead you to think I don't trust you I do, it's just this is complicated and I never thought we get tea. Yes, Inko interrupted him with a chuckle finding it more amusing than odd that the always clear and confident Toshi was stumbling over himself for once. Right. Right, Toshinori coughed as he regained his focus and then took a deep breath. Inko I need to tell you that I, that I am actually. All might, Inko finished Toshinori's sentence again for him in a quiet whisper as she glanced at the other patrons, her smile widened as she saw his eyes widen in shock and surprise. You knew, Toshinori shouted standing up briefly only to suddenly look sheepish as some of the other tables looked at him. You knew, how, for how long? About two weeks after we started having lunch together. Toshi, you look identical to him, just a little smaller with less muscles. Also every time you were late or had to run off All Might appeared on the news saving someone it wasn't hard to figure out. Inko replied deadpan as if the answer had been so obvious she didn't know why he had asked. Oh, yeah that makes sense, Toshinori felt like punching himself in the face for his stupidity. Of course she had figured it out Inko saw him every day and was one of the smartest and analytical people he had ever met. Maybe you should try, I don't know, a pair of glasses and styling your hair a little differently when you're not on patrol, we could look at maybe a ponytail style easy to tie back but simple to undo or maybe a hat, that could work, or maybe. Inko's face fell into a thoughtful frown as she went full ramble as her mind analyzed everything they could do. Half it was inaudible as she just went faster and faster before suddenly stopping. Oh sorry, I was rambling again wasn't I? Only a little, Toshinori chuckled feeling all the tension and worry that he had been building up for weeks at his decision to tell Inko the whole truth just vanish, I feel like an idiot now. No, Inko leaned over the table and placed her slender slim hand over his much larger one, a cheeky smile appearing on her face. Well, maybe a little. Hey. He shot back with his own grin as he turned his hand over and squeezed hers the two just looking at each other for a few moments. 
Still if it got me this lovely view and a great meal I don't mind you being a little stupid every now and then. Inko teased without any seriousness, loving the feel of warmth radiating off of Toshinori. Her heart always skipped a little when she saw him looking at her like this. Well, I might have a little more foolishness left in me, and there's more I need to tell you about me and my quirk but first. Toshinori gripped her hand a little more tightly as his other hand slipped out of sight to retrieve the item that was crucial for tonight and could be used, now that he knew she was okay with his heroic identity, Inko I have something very important to ask you. Will. Boom. Inko didn't even feel the explosion that blasted apart the top of the building, ripping through the restaurant's top floor seating. She blinked, and suddenly found that she was behind All Might's towering figure as he shielded her from the explosion. Toshinori had transformed and as she took in what happened she could see the other restaurant patrons and staff were strewn on the floor behind him as well. Somehow he had saved them and her all in the time it took her to blink, she knew he was supposed to be fast but this was insane. She opened her mouth to say something when suddenly a huge bolt of electricity slammed into All Might from his left side whilst a beam of red energy struck him head on. Ah, All Might roared as he took the brunt of the attacks his eyes scanning the area. Quickly seeing his two attackers, he just needed an opening then he sue, ah. Uh. He felt himself move as a third attacker blindsided him on the right, it was a person as tall as him but his entire body was made out of diamonds obviously a result of his quirk. He grounded his heels, digging into the floor to prevent himself from moving anymore and took the diamond hammering into his side. It wasn't ideal but he couldn't move or else Inko and the other bystanders he had saved would be vaporized. He just had to wait for the other two attackers to run out of steam and then he could deal with these punks. Die All Might, die. The diamond-skinned man grinned like a lunatic as he hammered into All Might's exposed side tearing his already tattered clothes to pieces. Die 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 die. All Might gritted his teeth his mind trying to think of a possible alternative as the two ranged attacks kept him pinned in place. His eyes were also searching for any more surprises, he had been stupid in focusing on the two obvious threats and missed the diamond-skinned man on his right. He already knew who was behind this attack and so could take no chances especially with Inko now being in the crossfire. Although he kept his smile present his eyes turned into a snarl as he wondered how this had happened and where he had tripped up, he would never forgive himself for placing her in danger. Just as that thought crossed his mind the twin attacks of pure energy and electricity keeping him in place died off, as his two attacks ran out of steam. Okay my turn, All Might exploded into action before he could be pinned again, his fist slammed into the diamond-skinned man next to him, Texas Smash. The effect was immediate the man's diamond skin cracked as he seemed to hover in the air for a second before suddenly being blown back clear across the demolished rooftop dining area. All Might turned bringing his hands together hard creating a shockwave that he directed at the woman who had been shooting the red energy beam at him. The woman's eyes went wide as she found herself nearly blown off the roof as the shockwave slammed into her body causing her bones to vibrate as he went flying. The electricity quirk user didn't fare even better as before he could even shout or move at seeing his comrades being floored All Might suddenly appeared before him his blinding speed sending the air rushing past him. He didn't even get to raise his arms before All Might's fist slammed into his face sending him careening straight into the floor and into unconsciousness. All of you head to the fire exit now. All Might turned and pointed to the exit his eyes lingering on Inko when suddenly he felt the red beam of energy slam into him again. Ah. You don't play fair do you? He crossed his arms moving to position himself so that neither the attack nor the energy blasting off of him would injure any innocent bystanders. As he saw them rush towards the fire exit on the right side of the building and out of harm's way he pushed off of the ground leaping into the sky. The move caught his attacker off guard and before she could redirect her attack he slammed both of his feet into her sending her like her friend into the sweet embrace of unconsciousness. All Might let out a breath as he stepped off of his defeated foe but he had no time to rest as he heard a shout behind him. As he twisted around he found himself for the first time ever frozen as saw what had made the cry for help, he tried to take a step forward but was halted by a snarling shout. Stop there or I'll break her neck. The diamond-skinned quirk user lifted up his left hand and there in his grip was Inko her feet dangling off the floor. The quirk user did not look great, 
He was bleeding from the forehead and his diamond skin was cracked and broken all over his body revealing normal human flesh beneath. All Might's mind went into override trying to come up with a plan to save her but everyone put her in some measure of danger and that was slowing his response. He tensed ready to dart forward but Inko let out a cry as the diamond-skinned man squeezed her neck seeing his foe was about to move. All Might felt something well up inside his chest. It was a feeling he hadn't had since he saw his master Nana Shimura push him away as she faced certain doom. It was a look that wasn't missed by his foe as the man's eyes winded as he looked between Inko and All Might. Oh, ha, she's special isn't she? The villain's mad grin widened as moved his arm more in front of him, swinging Inko like a doll, loving the love of fear and the symbol of peace eyes as she cried in pain. The boss just thought she was one night of fun but this is perfect. When he finds out oh boy, he's going to ah, bitch. Both men had been too distracted to notice that Inko had been using her quirk to slowly pull a sharp shard of broken diamond skin into her hand. She had then jammed the sharp piece of diamond into the hand's hand aiming for a crack she could just see from her position. The reaction was immediate he released her as pain shot through his hand but as he did so he backhanded her with his other hand that was covered in broken diamond skin. Ah. All Might's eyes watched the strike hit Inko and then without thinking he exploded forward electricity sparking around his right fist as poured all his strength into this punch. Oh she, the villain's eyes just watched as his doom came hurtling towards him with no possible way to avoid it. Crack, boom, Might Tower, Minato, Tokyo, a few hours later. Inko lifted a hand to her left cheek feeling the bandages present that were covering her one injury from the villain's attack. The cut wasn't actually all that bad occurring to the doctor that Toshinori had rushed her to straight after he, dispatched, the villain who had nearly killed her. The cut was a little deep and would leave a visible scar but other than that, she was completely fine, although as her finger traced over the bandage, she let out a sigh. She was already subconscious about her looks, she knew she wasn't a great beauty and did wonder what Toshinori saw in her at times and a scar was the last thing she needed. She sat up and moved off of the medical bed she had been left on, she was still a little surprised that the tower had a whole medical floor she never knew about but as she thought about it, it wasn't surprising at all. Toshi was dedicated to helping people, so it should be no surprise that the headquarters of his super alter ego would be equipped to aid the city in a medical capacity if needed. She quietly picked up her high-heeled shoes that Toshi had retrieved and left beside the bed for when she got up electing to go barefoot for the moment as one. The high heels killed her feet and two, they made noise when she walked in them and it was something like 4 a.m. She was pretty sure she was the only patient on the entire floor but didn't want to disrupt someone in case she was wrong. She was supposed to be getting some sleep but in truth, despite the doctor's orders and early hours she just wasn't tired. She wasn't sure if was the adrenaline still coursing through her or her burning desire to just see Toshi. He had been with her as much as he could but he had been preoccupied with getting her to safety and then had to rush off when his sidekick Sir Night Eye had come to speak to him about the attack. She needed to speak with him, not only did she want to know what he was about to ask her but she had something to tell him too. As she gently pushed open the door to the room she was in she stopped as she heard a pair of voices in the corridor. The door was open only a crack but she could see All Might's sidekick Sir Night Eye standing at the end of the corridor speaking to an extremely short, elderly man with a cane. The elderly man had very heavy wrinkles and a scrawny build with grey and spiky hair, styled short with some bangs hanging forward and a trimmed beard. What was he thinking? Sir Night Eye shook his head as he spoke to Gran Torino All Might's old teacher and one of the few people the number one hero listened to. To do something so stupid and reckless. You think him having a relationship is stupid and reckless huh? Inko couldn't see Gran Torneo's raised eyebrow from her position so only got the causal tone he was speaking with. What? No. Sir Night Eye locked taken aback at the mere suggestion however that was quickly replaced by a frown. He's my friend and I want him to be happy but. But. The elder hero pressed his eyes narrowing a little as he watched All Might's sidekick rub his eyes like he always did when frustrated. But. Dot her. She's one step up from being a college intern, if this gets out it could ruin his image with a lot of people. Night Eye shook his head, he still could not understand what had gotten into his friend, he's always been so focused, so dedicated towards his goal. Creating a better world, why throw it away? Hey, 
He's as dedicated as ever towards that goal. Grand Tranio grunted feeling tension rising in his old bones at his student and friend's successor's motives were being challenged. Before he sighed, maybe she helps, maybe she's the one thing he's allowing in behind that smile he shows the world. Maybe he needs her. Needs her to get him killed, Esser Nighteye grunted back his face forming a rare snarl that he quickly shook off. Inko's eyes widened at the pro hero's words feeling a cold chill go up her spine. That's uncalled for. Grand Tranio shot back, he didn't know the last Toshinori was seeing but he hated anyone being talked about like that without a chance to defend themselves at least. It's true, tonight was all because of her. Esser Nighteye felt the blood rise in him. Tonight was a disaster that could easily have been avoided. All Might got sloppy, he went outside the protocols we created to protect him all to set up a dinner date. We are lucky that he wasn't certain of the info and didn't show up himself. All Might could have been killed, hundreds if not thousands could have been cut in the crossfire as well. I'm not denying tonight how he did what he did was stupid, Grand Tranio conceded and already had a speech ready to give his former student when he saw him. He might be foolish at times but Toshinori can handle himself, he proved that tonight. Not around her, Esser Nighteye replied slowly, the older pro opened his mouth to respond but Nighteye didn't let him, don't deny it, you saw the same footage I did before he scrubbed it. He froze. Inko felt the chill that had run up her spine creep into her heart as she recalled seeing All Might standing before the villain frozen with hesitation. She had seen All Might on the news and internet for years. She had always admired him, knew he won no matter what, was the pillar everyone could rely on and never showed any fear. Except now she knew something his millions of fans and admirers didn't, he was human. It was easy to idolize All Might and put him on a pillar above everyone but she knew Toshinori he was the best person she ever knew but he had fears and worries like anyone else. What happens the next time? It could get her, him or an innocent bystander killed. And what if someone learns who she is to him? Every villain, including him, will know all they need to stop the symbol of peace is to get to her. If she stays, it puts everyone in Dan. Inko closed the door not wanting to hear any more as she sat on the bed she had just left her mind was already reeling at the picture All Might's sidekick painted. Despite part of her trying to reassure herself her analytical mind just went into overdrive going deeper and deeper down a path her heart was screaming at her to avoid. She wasn't sure how long she just sat there staring at the floor, but it was long enough for her mind to play through every scenario she could think of and come to a conclusion she dreaded. Inko, her head snapped up and saw Toshinori, her Toshi not the hulking figure of All Might standing tentatively in slightly open doorway. I'm Aquake, she said trying to make her voice as steady as she could as she looked up at him. I just wanted to check on you, I was just trying to track where those villains had come from. Toshinori moved fully into the room closing the door behind him, trying to sound more confident than he was. Sorry I took so long. Did you find it? Inko asked her heart hoping to grab onto one ray of hope, that this was over and that whoever Esser Nighteye and the man he had been speaking to was behind bars. He didn't respond his eyes just glanced away from her, giving her all the answer she needed. She closed her eyes briefly willing herself to do this but before she could she had to reach out for one last ray in the gathering dark. She opened them her eyes connecting with Toshi's as he looked back to her. Toshi are you in danger? Inko was hoping she was wrong and that she didn't have to do what her stupid analytical brain was telling her was her only real choice. Don't joke or brush me up. That villain who held me mentioned a boss. And I heard, it doesn't matter, just tell me are you in danger? Toshinori just looked at her, he wanted to in that moment just to lie to her, to put this night behind them and go on with their lives. However, he knew he couldn't he owed her the truth, that what this night had supposed to been about, telling her everything. As he opened his mouth he couldn't help but wince as the image of his master flashed in his mind. Yes, I am, Tashi's admission caused her heart to sink like a stone, there's a villain, a monster, he runs everything, all the crime all the corruption, in Japan and across a lot of the global he's behind it. His name is Al. I can't do this, Inko's whispered words caused him to freeze as his blood turned to ice, as he saw tears running down her cheeks. Normally when she cried it was like a river washing away everything in its path, something he secretly loved about her. 
He remembered when they had watched a movie with a tragic death scene at her place, he thought he would need to conduct a river recuse with the amount she cried. However, this wasn't that, her tears were small in volume but more devastating than if they had washed him away. What do you mean? I can't do this, it's, it's all too much. Inko stood up grabbing her things as she rushed towards the door, I'm sorry. Wait please. Toshi grabbed her arm before she could slip past him his reflexes were such that she never stood a chance. Do they know about me? Inko didn't look at him although he held her arm she was still facing the door behind him. No, it's what I was making sure of. He tried to move closer to her, but she just shifted away from him. He felt his heart wrenching apart as he told her the truth. They don't know about us. They think you were just. I just. I can't Toshi. I can't. Inko's words caused his grip to loosen just enough that she slipped from it and ran out of the door. Toshinori could only turn and look at the closed door, his body for once not leaping into action as just stared at the closed. He didn't move for a good while, long enough that the door eventually opened again. For a brief second, he hoped it was her running back but instead, he just saw his friend and sidekick Mirai who the world knew as Esser Nighteye standing there. I saw her leave. She told me she is resigning. She left the building a few minutes ago. Mirai shifted as he saw the blank emotionless face of his best friend. He felt his own heart break a little at the sight. Toshi I am sore. It doesn't matter. All Might's towering figure suddenly appeared as Toshinori transformed into his muscle form and strode past his friend. His sidekick didn't say a word or even follow him knowing it was best to leave him to work through this at his own speed. Toshinori was grateful as he felt his body tremble especially as he opened up his other hand and saw the ring box he had kept safe throughout the night. He paused briefly as opened it up and saw the emerald crusted engagement ring he had bought for Inko, his hand trembled for a moment before he stopped it, turning his nerves to steel. As one thought replaced the crushing despair that was raging inside of him. I am going to find all for one and end him. Inko Haikatsuga's apartment 40 minutes later. Inko hadn't gotten very far into her apartment she was curled up with her head on her knees as cried like she never had before. She knew she had to do this, All Might couldn't be distracted by her he had a world to save and he couldn't do it if he was afraid for her safety. All Might was the symbol of peace and justice, she was just getting in the way of that, keeping him from saving the world all for something as selfish as love. However, she knew that wasn't the reason she had done what she did, no it had been the danger Esser Nighteye had spoken of, of her becoming a target. She in truth didn't care about that, she was willing to brave any danger as long as Toshi was beside her and wanted her there but there's more to consider now. That terrible thought wormed its way back into her head as she lifted her eyes and looked at the doctor's letter she had been keeping in her purse, it's what I was going to show Toshi tonight. She was willing to risk anything to be with him despite the dangers to her and she knew she would only push him forward in his quest for peace. She would risk anything except one thing, her eyes lingered on the words in the doctor's letter. We are happy to confirm the results from the first blood tests and your own positive result, you Inko Haikatsuga are currently two weeks pregnant. She didn't read the rest of the letter as her hands went to her stomach and cradled it, hoping she had made the right choice to raise her baby away from danger whilst their father saved the world. Musudafu Children's Park, Musudafu, Japan 10 years ago, July. Inko sat on the park bench feeling the warmth of the sun on her skin as she sat next to her friend Mitsuki Bakugo as they watched their children playing. They weren't sure what type of game they were playing but it was clearly something related to heroes if the names being called out were any indication. She resisted the urge to say something, knowing that pro heroes were a non-topic in their tiny apartment, however, Izuku like everyone else his age loved them and he needed to socialize so she bit her tongue for the moment. Her eyes glanced at Mitsuki's son Katsuki who had developed his quirk a few months ago and since then had become the leader of the gaggle of children she was watching, he let off a small puff of an explosion that resulted in Mitsuki yelling for him to be careful. The use of the quirk caused her to frown a little and turn her gaze to Izuku, if Katsuki was the leader of the group then Izuku was his constant shadow. Both mothers had been thrilled how close their boys had grown, the two were like brothers most of the time but Inko was starting to get a little worried as she saw their relationship changing. 
Izuku still hadn't developed his quirk and the power imbalance between the two was starting to develop into unhealthy territory where Katsuki made all the choices and Izuku meekly followed them. She wasn't the only one noticing the difference but beyond herself, Mitsuki and Mitsuki's husband Masaru very few of the adults seemed inclined to do anything about it. She suspected it was due to Katsuki's powerful quirk, she had seen the same thing when growing up, if one had a powerful quirk you were given a lot of leeway in how you acted. She was also getting worried about her son's lack of a quirk, he had turned four a few weeks ago and there was still no sign of it. He had yet to display any sign of attracting objects to him as she could or anything remotely close to. Dot his father's quirk, that thought made her pause for a second as her mind turned to Toshinori. She, like everyone else in the world, didn't actually know what All Might's quirk was, only that it made him strong and unstoppable, but beyond that, she had no idea what to be watching out for. Would Izuku suddenly be able to grow powerful muscles like Toshinori did? Or would he one day just start breaking things with incredible strength? Or what if he developed a weird combination of theirs and who knew what that would look like? I wish Toshinori was here. Inko blinked as the thought sounded in her head before she could dismiss it completely. She would be lying if she said Toshinori didn't cross her mind nearly once a day, mainly because pictures of All Might were everywhere but also because Izuku each day reminded her of him. However, that was largely due to how he acted rather than any physical resemblance on his part to the world's symbol of peace. She was thankful beyond belief that Izuku was nearly the spitting image of her instead of Toshinori which would have potentially led to awkward conversations as to why he looked like All Might. No Izuku mostly took after her, he had her round face, her round emerald green eyes, and in all, no one could until they were mother and son. However, one thing Izuku had inherited from his father which made her worry beyond belief that he would soon show signs of whatever Toshinori's quirk was. Izuku was tall for his age. Toshinori had towered over her, over everyone in fact, it was one of his most distinguishing features, the man stood at over seven feet tall even when not in his muscle form. As she looked at her son playing with the other children she could see he was easily the tallest kid in his year group, he wasn't freakishly tall but he was close. Looking at him she could tell that he was going to at least resemble his father in height, each year Izuku always grew a little faster than the other kids and she guessed it would be the one thing he would always beat his friend Katsuki on. Speaking of Katsuki the boy had let off another explosion although this one was a little more powerful than the sparks and puffs he normally did. It also appeared hot enough that it burnt the ground in front of him a little. Hey if you do that one more time you little brat I will end you. Mitsuki exploded to her feet, her fiery parenting style on display as she yelled at her kid before sitting back down again. That kid, he gets his quirk and it's all, bang, bang, boom, boom all the time. Why couldn't he just get mine? I swear if he breaks one more piece of furniture I am sending him to an orphanage. What did he break this time? Inko gave her friend a little smile as she pulled out her thermos and poured out two cups of tea passing one to her friend. The fridge, he wanted some milk and instead of asking for help, boom. Mitsuki gave a little sigh as she sipped Inko's tea. No fridge door, I swear the quirk counseling at their school is a joke. Well. I'm sure he'll get control soon. Inko gave her friend a supportive grin but couldn't help her eyes darting to her son and frowning a little. Oh shit, sorry Inko. Mitsuki gave an apologetic look as she looked awkwardly at the kids, the two had spoken on the topic more than once in recent months. Here I am complaining about my kids' quirks and I haven't asked how Izuku is handling things on the quirk front. He's, enthusiastic, can't wait to get it. Inko just sipped her tea not looking her friend in the eye as she looked at the children playing. We've got a doctor's appointment next week to see a specialist. Inko tried her best to hide her slight worry about what the test was going to show, her fears that Izuku would develop a quirk exactly like his father terrified her. She knew despite her rule against talking about pro heroes at home that Izuku idolized them and she suspected he had watched a certain video of All Might saving people on their computer when she was cooking. What scared her most wasn't people linking him to All Might but that if he developed the same quirk he would follow his father down the same path. She knew she was slightly biased because of her fears, she did admire All Might and respect what he had done but she was more aware than most of the dangers his life imposed on him. 
Inko is Izuku a bastard? Mitsuki's question caused Inko's eyes to widen and look directly at her overly blunt and direct friend. What? Inko's panic was mixed with shock at the brazen question, not sure how to respond to the sudden line of questioning. Inko we've been friends for over four years now and have practically raised our boys together. I've never met your husband, Hasashi, and the photos you have of him look like the stock photos of the fashion magazine we work for. Mitsuki stayed calm as she sipped her tea, her eyes darting to the other moms sitting close by but out of earshot of them. Also, every time something even remotely related to him, like Izuku's quirk, comes up you get all, weird, cryptic and lost in thought. And you touch that scar on your cheek. Inko blinked as she removed the hand from her face that had been tracing the faded but still visible scar on her face. And, and, how does that make you think Izuku is illegitimate? Because I'm a model, who has seen all the shit women go through because of men. I've seen girls become mistresses, have affairs, one night stands gone wrong, date a villain, get into drugs and the rest of it. I've seen the aftermath too when the bastards leave after the fun is gone. Mitsuki's eyes for once weren't filled with fierce competition or fiery resolve but a gentleness that came with experience. Look I'm not judging but you react like every girl I know who has a kid whose dad is someone important or dangerous or both and they can't talk about it. I just wanted you to know I'm here for you, no judgment. Inko was quiet for a few moments her eyes leaving her friends as she then stared at the ground gripping the cup of tea in her hands. She wanted to put on a smile and pretend Mitsuki was wrong, she could get angry but that wasn't Inko's speed and besides Mitsuki was just trying to be a good friend. Her eyes darted up and saw Izuku smiling as he and Katsuki, saved, one of the other children, her baby boy saw her looking and gave her a wave which she returned before letting out a sigh. Izuku's father is, it's complicated and staying was dangerous. It's why I moved here to keep my baby safe. Inko wasn't sure if she was feeling a weight lift off of her or her chest tighten as she decided to trust her friend with her fears. I'm just worried about Izuku's quirk if he takes after his father it's going to be. Did he give you that scar? Mitsuki was soft and gentle in her tone, not wanting to push her friend, she had met a few young models whose boyfriends had gotten rough with them. No, he never, he would never hurt me. Inko's response caused her friend to nod slowly her eyes taking in Inko and decided to believe her, she was far too calm for it to be a lie to cover up old abuse. So, can I ask what happened? Mitsuki pressed gently wanting to help her friend who she could see was carrying something that had been troubling her for years. Izuku's father and I were together for a few years. I loved him, I loved him so much but staying became, complicated and potentially dangerous. Inko resisted the urge to touch the scar on her face again, especially now that she knew people noticed she did it when Izuku's father was mentioned. Was he married? Mitsuki's question was awkward, she loved Inko like a sister and the woman didn't seem the type to have an affair but it would make sense, a powerful man having an affair could be dangerous. No, nothing like that. Inko chuckled at her friend's awkward shifting, before looking her right in the eye. He doesn't even know about Izuku. I left before he found out. His work was dangerous and I didn't want to expose a child to it. Okay, I won't press, Mitsuki gave her a smile seeing Inko was grateful but done sharing any more details about Izuku's father, but if you ever want to talk or anything let me know. Although I will say one thing about this mysterious man of yours. Oh yeah, what's that? Inko raised a curious eyebrow. If he let you go he must be the world's biggest idiot. Mitsuki drained the rest of her tea and smiled at her friend just as another explosion happened in the direction of the children. That's it you little brat. Come here, I'm going to end you. Inko could only chuckle as she watched Mitsuki rushing towards her son, the other children rushing away from the raging woman who had a visible aura of terror coming off of her. The only two children that didn't move was Mitsuki's son Katsuki who seemed to ignore his mother's yelling and her own son Izuku. She couldn't help but smile as her son tried to defend his friend from his mother's worth only for Katsuki to shout at him that he was fine, that caused her smile to drop a little but Izuku didn't seem to care and just kept trying to help. Maybe I'm overthinking it, maybe it will all be okay. Midoriya Family Apartment Musudafu, Japan 10 years ago, the day after the specialist appointment. Inko stood still as she washed the plate in her hand again for the tenth time. 
Izuku was in her room which doubled as her office, she could hear the video he was watching. It was the famous clip of All Might's debut on his return to Japan, she would normally go in and turn it off but right now she didn't have the heart. She wasn't sure what to do as she stared blankly at the plate in her hand, out of everything that had ever crossed her mind with Izuku this had never even remotely registered on her radar. She knew something was wrong after they had run a whole battery of tests and left them in the doctor's office alone for over three hours, however, even then she had never expected this. Sorry kid it's not going to happen, the specialist's cold tone and blunt words echoed in her head as she felt anger rise in her at his callous approach. Crack, oh shoot, Inko looked down and saw she had cracked the plate in her grip and cut her hand a little, quickly putting the plate to the side and running the cut under the tap. She hadn't really spoken to Izuku since it had happened that they had got back so late that she had just curled up with him on her bed and held him. Her son was, quirkless. The shock of it was still catching up to her, she knew about 20% of the population didn't have a quirk but she had never actually met anyone who was quirkless. The closest she had ever got were friends who had relatives that were quirkless but even then they always seemed to be living somewhere else or out of sight. No one wanted to talk about it but she knew that a lot of quirkless people ended up in dead-end jobs or worse, they also had a very high rate of sway. No, we are not going there. Inko shook the thought out of her head, as her eyes glanced to her room the door was ajar and she could hear sound coming from it. Oh baby what can I do? What can I say? Would Toshinori know what to say? That thought caused her to take a deep breath, that wasn't an option now more than ever. She knew how the world would react if they found out All Might had a kid. The pressure that would put her boy under the expectations of him, the dangers. But All Might having a quirkless kid. Izuku was already in for a lifetime of hardship as a quirkless person, he didn't need that added to by being the poor quirkless son of the world's greatest hero. She felt her heart tearing itself apart at the thought of her Izuku being torn apart by the society that worshipped his father for failing to be like him through no fault of his own. One question was lingering in her head though as she kept her bleeding hand running under the tap. How, how had this happened? Her parents both had quirks, and so had all of her grandparents and her great-grandparents, they were all gone now but she never knew anyone in her family not having a quirk. She didn't know much about Toshinori's family, he had only told her they died in a villain attack and she had never pressed. However, he was all might so she didn't doubt that his family probably had a history of powerful quirks, so that couldn't be it. She felt tears welling up in her eyes, as she concluded it must have been her side of the family, some quirkless relative no one ever talked about, that she had done this to her son. She knew he wanted a quirk more than anything else in the world, she knew that despite her only strict rules about no hero talk in the house that her son wanted to become a hero. Oh God, Izuku I am so sorry, I wish the were, Inko felt the tears starting to flood out of her but they were halted as she felt something warm on her leg. As she looked down she could see that in her haze of emotional turmoil thinking about Toshinori, Izuku and her failing him she hadn't noticed he had slipped from her room. Her son was hugging her leg so tightly and although she could see he had been crying he had dried his tears as he tried to hug her as well as his small frame would allow. He had even fixed a broad smile on his face that didn't even remotely reach his eyes but in that moment it didn't matter as he looked up at her. He took after his father so much without even the remotest hint about who he was. Mom, don't cry please. Izuku was clearly a wreck himself but all he cared about right now was that his mother was crying and he wanted it to stop, I'm okay. See I'm smiling, please don't be sad, I'm sorry if I made yo. It was Izuku's turn to be cut off as Inko suddenly pulled him tight to her momentarily knocking the air from his small lungs. She was holding him now off of the ground clutching him to her chest as he wrapped his small hands around her neck, trying with all his might to make her happy. She fought back her own tears as all the things she had planned to say to him went out of her head, the apology she was going to blurt out and how sorry she was his dream was never going to come true. She knew that was the truth though, that despite his hope and desire of becoming a great hero like his father, he was doomed to live a life in the shadows. However, as she pulled back from the hug and saw him still smiling at her she knew that tough conversation could wait another day. Her eyes went from her son to his room, it was tiny like the rest of the apartment and apart from a few toys was completely bare. 
He had wanted posters of heroes all over the walls but had stopped that when she had told him no, the same with more than a few action figures he had pointed to when they were out. However, Izuku was incredibly well behaved for a four-year-old and although he hadn't understood and been sad at the event he had never cried or pushed her on it. She knew her avoidance of pro-hero worshipping made her at best an oddball and at worst a social pariah, even amongst fully grown adults not liking the pro-hero scene was seen as crazy. However, try as she might as just couldn't look at any hero without seeing Toshinori and the devastated look on his face the last time she had seen him. What didn't help was that it was usually Toshinori's face that she was seeing All Might was so omnipresent amongst heroes that she believed like 9 out of 10 photos of heroes were just him. That notwithstanding, she knew the real reason she had always avoided it was because she had been terrified of Izuku following down Toshinori's path and living a life filled with violence and danger. He's been so brave, he deserves something to make this day not a total wreck. Inko turned her attention back to her son plastering her own fragile smile on her face, and it's not like he's at risk anymore of becoming a pro is it? We can let him dream a little, it's what Toshi would do let him dream before settling him into reality. Izuku why don't go get your shoes on, Izuku gave him a little squeeze as she put him down on the floor, bending over so she could look him right in the face with her wide smile, we are going down to that store you love. I think someone deserves something for being such a brave boy, don't you? Really, Izuku's eyes widened the shock of his mother agreeing to take him to the hero shop stopped all tears flowing. Yes, really, if you are quick you might even get two, Inko gave her son a teasing ruffle of his already messy hair and chuckled as he shot out of the room. As he left she stood up allowing the worry and concern to return to her face, which stopped for a moment as she felt her hand stinging again. She looked down remembering the cut, and whilst Izuku raced to get ready she placed a plaster on the wound the bleeding having decreased to barely anything. When Izuku returned ready for his treat, she quickly plastered on another smile offered her hand and gladly took him out of the apartment. The shop wasn't very far from their home and Inko knew exactly where it was as she had made a point to avoid passing it unless absolutely necessary. It was a typical hero store, a mix of arcade, toy store, and general paraphernalia that ultra fans collected, and it was filled mostly with children and teenagers. She gently guided Izuku through the store, her eyes fixed ahead of her as she ignored the omnipresent pictures of All Might that was everywhere, but she could bear it for now. She let go of her son as they reached the section of the store that was a bit quieter than the rest and looked age appropriate, as he rushed off to look at all the hero stuff on sale she couldn't help feel the worry return to her. Free Sample Miss Inko blinked and saw a store employee was offering some sort of chocolate-covered treat in the shape of a hero she didn't recognize. You can have as many as you like, the kids don't seem interested today and they are just going to be chucked. Oh, N. Inko held up a hand to refuse but stopped as her eyes caught Izuku again darting between action figures as she felt her stomach flip with worry. Well, maybe just one. She just watched her son for a few minutes not noticing that she not only eat the first snack but her hand quickly returned to the employee's plate stopping them leaving. The young employee shifted a little uncomfortably as the mother just gazed at her son whilst devouring the entire plate without saying a word to him. He was more than a little when the green-haired boy bolted back over clutching one of the more popular items the store solid for children, a Silver Age All Might action figure that said up to hundred different phrases. Look mom it's All Might. And he talks. Izuku was almost leaping into the air with excitement as he pushed All Might's chest. I am here. Izuku was so enraptured by his idol speaking that he missed his mother flinching at hearing Toshinori's voice. Can I get it, mom? Please. Izuku looked up just missing his mother's reaction as she put on a smile that could only fool a child as the store employee glanced at her a little bit worried now. Of course sweetheart, Inko said as her hand went automatically for the now empty tray her burrow furrowing as she failed to pick up another comforting snack, her eyes going to the tray rather than the employee. Oh, you don't have any more do you? Might Tower, Annual All Might Charity Gala 10 years ago August. I am here, All Might landed on the stage before the flashing lights of cameras and the applause of the crowd. To thank you for coming. Now please have a great night and remember every donation helps a number of worthy good causes. All Might felt himself go on autopilot for the next few hours as he greeted, 
smiled, posed, autographed anything offered and generally sold the charities to the rich and famous around him. He didn't necessarily hate this annual event, in fact, he was extremely proud of the record-breaking amount of money each year the gala raised each, he just wished it all was. A bit less, it was basically an entire night of just standing around for him, so rich people could gawk at him, say they met the number one hero and take a photo. However, he could bear all that for the good tonight did, although it didn't stop him from twitching a little, he was a man of action and standing around really wasn't his thing. And finally this is Mr. and Mrs. Yaoyorozu, of the Yaoyorozu Corporation, All Might returned to complete focus as the event coordinator introduced the last people he had to speak to. They are the top donors tonight. It is a pleasure to meet you, All Might gave the couple a bow of his head and his best smile, which earned grins from the extremely wealthy couple. The pleasure is all ours, Mrs. Yaoyorozu responded as she and her husband moved next to him sp their photo could be taken. We are huge admirers of yours, as is our daughter. She wants to be a hero just like you. Then I wish her all the best, the world can never have enough people striving to make it a better place. All Might responded as the last photo was taken and the couple shook his hand. Indeed, thank you All Might and have a pleasant evening. Mr. Yaoyorozu and his wife gave a deep bow before moving off wanting to let the symbol of peace enjoy his evening without further interference. All Might waited for a few moments making sure no one else wanted a photo before he moved off himself making a beeline for the back of the house area the event coordinator cordoned off. Once he was safely out of sight, he released all the tension and power coursing through him resulting in the only slightly less muscular form of Toshinori appearing. He released a sigh as he readjusted his bowtie and headed back out to speak with his sidekick Sir Nighteye about their current operations and investigations. He could have just done it in his All Might form but in truth, he was just tired now and a quick conversation without someone wanting him for an autograph or photo. He weaved through the crowd his massive height and frame making it a little difficult as Toshinori didn't command the same level of deference and respect All Might did. So he was constantly forced to apologize, wait for people to move or else just find a completely different route when the odd person wouldn't make way. It took him about 20 minutes to reach Sir Nida even though he was less than a hundred yards away from him, all of which earned him a rare full smile from Mirai. Enjoying yourself, Mirai teased as he arrived next to him squeezing past one particular older woman who glared at him for forcing her to move his seat. Of course, nothing like battling the forces of overcrowding and buffet lines, Toshinori gave a chuckle as he gestured to the event around them which every year just got more packed. So how are we doing? Very good we over last year's donations and the night is still young. I might suggest another appearance later, crack a joke or make a thank you speech and we should go plus ultra tonight, Mirai responded readjusting his glasses as he and Toshinori walked around to avoid being overheard. Good, and how are we doing on the other thing? Toshinori asked his eyes darting to people they passed but he relaxed as he didn't see anyone trying to listen in. We are progressing. The dismantling of that trafficking ring was certainly a blow but it's made the ones I had my eye on go to ground, so it's made it more difficult at the moment. His sidekick released a sigh as he delivered his less than ideal news but did perk up at the one sliver lining he had come across, however, I did meet someone during the investigation, he is a detective his name is Sukauchi. He's got an interesting quirk, does solid work even without it and I think you should meet him. Can we trust him? Toshinori hated that he had to ask but his nemesis had more than a few cops on his payroll and they had been burnt before working too closely with the police as a result. I believe so, I'll keep looking into him but at the moment he's as honest a cop as I have ever seen. Mirai responded, knowing he needed to triple check everything and keep digging to be certain. Good, good, Toshinori gave a nod as the two stopped walking and stood by a standing table next to the dance floor. The two stood in a comfortable silence for a while with Toshinori just watching the crowd and Mirai doing the same, occasionally glancing at his friend. However, Mirai quickly saw that Toshinori wasn't watching the whole crowd his friend's eyes were lingering on a woman on the edge of the dance floor across from them. He knew immediately where his friend's mind was as the woman possessed a very particular shade of light green hair and when she turned her back to them she looked very similar to someone neither hero nor sidekick had seen in nearly five years. Mirai was about to say something but the look on Toshinori's face kept him silent, 
It was a look that he had rarely seen from the world's greatest hero and he knew it was best just to leave him for a few moments. The first few times he had interrupted Toshinori when he was like this, it hadn't ended well, the man hadn't been rude or angry but he had then thrown himself back into hero work to an even more unhealthy level than he already did. Toshinori had never spoken about Inko again, at least not to him and for a time Mirai thought that his friend had put the whole incident behind him, that it was a momentary distraction and he realized how wrong he had been in pursuing it. However, in the years since he would catch Toshinori every now and again looking at a woman, a scene or something else with a hint of longing and sadness. Mirai was never sure what to do when these moments happened, every time he looked back on Inko and the events of that night he felt a twinge of regret. He had been so certain that she was a mistake at the time and when he had spotted her listening into his conversation he hadn't held back for both her sake and Toshinori. Their life was dangerous and he knew that if she stuck around it would have endangered everything, likely gotten herself or at least someone killed, and his friend would never have been able to live with that. However, since she left he had seen a change in Toshinori, in public All Might was the same as ever, but in private his friend and idol had become more muted and slightly grim. His friend spent less and less time as Toshinori and every chance he had he was All Might, even when he didn't need to be. Even when he was Toshinori he was far less sociable, he rarely talked to regular people, he had stopped taking lunch in the main cafeteria and seemingly didn't have time for anyone new unless it was related to finding all for one. He hadn't been idle watching his friend change and had tried to help, even to the point he had tried to set Toshinori up on a few dates with several female pro heroes. That had been a disaster that he wasn't going to get into and had only seemingly driven Toshinori further down the rabbit hole he was in and he was starting to get worried for his friend. Mirai looked from the woman Toshinori was looking at back at his friend his mind racing to a thought he was considering more and more. Maybe I should look up Ink. Sir Night Eye. Mirai turned and saw it was one of the gala's coordinators holding a clipboard in her hands. We need you for several things backstage. Mirai frowned a little and looked from the coordinator to his friend but before he could say anything Toshinori just gave him a broad smile and waved him away. Go and let me know if you need me okay. Toshinori's words earned him a nod from his sidekick who left to sort out whatever issue had arisen. The moment he was out of sight however Toshinori felt the smile fall from his face as he turned his attention back to the dance floor and saw the green-haired woman had moved out of his sight. He let out a thankful sigh at that. Tonight was supposed to be about rising money for a number of good causes, he needed to focus on that not on, her. He regretted even the passing thought of Inko as it caused an image of her to flash in his head, she was a green dress, twirling around the dance floor and laughing at his poor moves. The memory returned a smile to his face as he remembered the gala from five years ago where he had brought Inko as his secret date, they had shared one dance under the guise of friendship. What I wouldn't give to just see her again let alone dance, Toshinori felt the smile again fade from his face as he watched the dance floor where a number of couples were pressed close together. I could always look her up and see if shish no. Toshinori winced a little as his more rational side that resided in his head reared to life again, smacking down the foolish thought his heart kept trying to raise. When she had first left he had nearly run after her been so close to chasing her down and promising anything to get her to stay but he knew he couldn't, he had a job to do. So he had distracted himself any way he could. For the first few months after she left he had chased down every lead on the people who had attacked them, where they came from, who supported them, who paid them, all of it. He had hoped if he pushed hard enough at that door it would lead him to all for one so he could finally end that monster and the terror he wrought on the world. However, like every other route to the monster he had taken he had dismantled a part of all for one's criminal empire, made the world safer and saved lives but never came close to reaching the man himself. After he had exhausted that avenue, he found himself stuck again and that had led to more than a few nights of him being alone with his thoughts, thoughts that invariably turned to her. So he had further distracted himself by going full steam at the underworld, not leaving a moment for doubt, loneliness or regret to creep in. There was also strategy to this approach beyond keeping himself occupied, their old method of targeting key points of all for one's operation to reach the man hadn't worked. So Toshinori had decided that the only way he was ever going to stop all for one was to dismantle not pieces of his empire but the whole thing, all at once. 
Mirai wasn't thrilled at the approach as he thought it was stretching all might too thin and that it would take years for it to work, all for one's empire was huge and reached across the world. However, that didn't deter Toshinori at all, if it took years, it took years, this was the only way he saw it reaching his nemesis and ending his terror. He had to be the unstoppable hero, the symbol of peace and justice, the force that no criminal could resist, he had to overwhelm all for one's ability to operate if he didn't the criminal would just regrow like a weed elsewhere. If he broke up the Monter's empire quicker than he could rebuild it eventually the snake would show himself, he would have to, to prove to the criminal underworld that he was in control. When that happened All Might would be there, for his master and all the others the monster had hurt he would finish it. His unrelenting assault on all for one's operations hadn't gone unnoticed by the world and although Mirai was skeptical he was already seeing progress. The crime rate in Japan had dropped steadily in the last four years, the public was calling it his golden age and criminals were becoming less frequent. He could feel the change he had wanted to bring about for so long coming into effect, all he had to do was keep pushing and the world he dreamed of would become a reality. A world where everyone can smile, where everyone is safe, where she is safe. Might Tower, Tokyo, Japan five years ago April. Mirai Sasaki sat quietly watching an old clip of his friend saving people from a burning derailed train. The incident wasn't one of All Might's more famous saves and had largely been forgotten by the general public, but Mirai had always liked it. He was watching it right now to calm his nerves and had one hand clamped down on his right leg to prevent it from tapping on the floor and revealing his inner turmoil to the people around him. He had spent years crafting his calm controlled persona to the public, police and fellow pro heroes, he did not need it ruined all because he couldn't get his leg from tapping. We have confirmation, Mirai lifted his eyes from the screen to Detective Naomasa Sukauchi, who had just glanced at the old clip he was watching. A smile appeared for a second before the detective refocused on him. The plan worked, the raids were successful, and All Might apprehended Toxic Chainsaw. It was public and certainly drew attention. How is he? Mirai gave a quick glance at the room, which was largely empty despite the size of the operation they had just undertaken. Apart from himself and Naomasa, only about a dozen other people were present, all of whom had been vetted screened and questioned by himself and the deceptive more than once. They were a very odd mixture of several other detectives, a couple of pro heroes who worked more behind the scenes and highly skilled employees who worked in the tower. The people in the room represented the only people he had any confidence in, even then his trust in them didn't extend very far. Only Naomasa and himself knew the full extent of what had just unfolded and how large scale it had been. Doctors have looked him over, he's fine. The fight was and Chainsaw got a few hits in but nothing major. Naomasa gave his own glance at the room before passing the tablet he was holding to All Might's sidekick. However, we have a little problem. What problem? Mirai felt a knot form in his stomach, he knew something was going to come up but this was far too quick, he took the tablet and as he looked at the raids, results his eyes widened. This can't be right, is this number right? Yes, I've checked it four times, also had the numbers hero, decimal look over them. Naomasa leaned in pretending to be looking at the pad as he whispered to the pro feeling uncomfortable as well. They are right, and we aren't even finished yet. Where is he? Mirai turned off the computer he was sitting at and stood up his sudden motion caused several people to look at him but he ignored them. He's in his office. Naomasa replied and didn't even wait for a response before heading to the door as Sir Nighteye was already striding towards it. The two didn't say anything as they moved quickly from the command center they had set up in the tower to the very top floor of the tower. The only thing that stopped Mirai from bursting into his best friend's office was the imposing and nearly impenetrable vault-like door that blocked the entrance to All Might's office. The Might Gate as the staff of the tower called it was a well-known feature of the tower. It made All Might's office arguably the safest location in all of Japan and it would only open for All Might himself. When Naomasa first encountered it he thought it was slightly overkill but now he knew the full extent of what the symbol of peace was fighting he believed that the gate and the office's security system might not be enough. They weren't stopped for long however as the vault-like door started to turn and hiss as it opened allowing them entrance to the office of the world's greatest hero. There were literally thousands of posts and theories across multiple fan sites as to what All Might's office looked like and honestly, 
in Naomasa's opinion, they would all be disappointed. The office wasn't very large, it had two desks present, one was massive and completely bare apart from a few framed photos, the other desk was small and piled with paperwork with a framed photo of All Might on the wall behind it. The only other real feature of note was a bed tucked into the corner office next to a walking bathroom with a shower. Originally Naomasa had assumed the bed and bathroom were for if All Might worked too late to go home, however, he had quickly deduced that All Might didn't keep a permanent residence. The symbol of peace moved around sporadically, largely staying in hotel rooms or short-term rents, the office with its bed was the closest that All Might had to a home. So how did the raids go? Toshinori asked in his normal form, he was placing a shirt over his extremely muscled torso that showed more than a few bruises from his fight. I'll tell you that Punk landed some hits. We have a problem. Mirai stepped fully into his role as All Might's sidekick Sir Nighteye, his calm calculating demeanor going into override as he walked up and handed Toshinori the pad. What happened? Did someone get hurt or were there civilian casualties? Damn it I knew I show. Toshinori's heart went into panic mode, he should have led the raids himself and not gone to arrest the Punk with the chainsaw. Toshi breathed, stop, focus and just read the pad, Sir Nighteye's steady calm voice cut off his friend before he could spiral further tapping said pad to draw focus to it. Toshi stopped as instructed, took a grounding breath and then looked at the digital pad that he had been given. His eyes narrowed as he went through it all, the raids had been a success and yielded the results he had suspected they would, it would be a great blow to. Toshi's eyes widened as he saw that the information just kept going and going and going. The raids hadn't just succeeded, they had been far more successful than he, Night Eye or Detective Sukauchi could have predicted. Not that was an issue for All Might but it might complicate the next stages of the plan or cause them to accelerate. After years of smashing one of all for one's operations after another, and then going full steam at everything all at once, they had gained a pretty good idea of the extent of the criminal empire. Naomasa and Mirai had then used that picture together with scraps of information they had pieced together over the years to finally start tracing the thing all the illegal operations needed to function. Money. It had been Naomasa's project for the last few years, whilst All Might smashed the villains on the street and Night Eye scoped out the criminal enterprises they ran, the detective traced every yen, dollar, pound and euro that funded them all of which had accumulated into today's raids across not just Japan but the globe as well. Using Naomasa's information they had discovered hundreds of front businesses, dummy accounts and physical stash houses across the world that they estimated funded large swaths of all for one's empire. The tough part had been not tipping their hand as to how much they had uncovered so for the past few months, the three of them had been setting up separate raids across the world with multiple police departments and heroes. The key was for no one apart from them to know all the raids were linked or even happening, they were all independently scheduled to happen at the same time so no one had time to react. All Might had provided the cover for the operations in Japan by engaging in the apprehension of Toxic Chainsaw, a villain who was not only at the top of the most wanted list but Night I believed ran all for one's drug operations in the central prefectures. His arrest had been a public fight that had drawn media attention away from the hundreds of raids of businesses, warehouses and even homes occurring across the country. Is this number right? Toshinori finally spoke as he reached the end of the summary that concluded with the total amount of assets seized. Yes, and it's only going to get larger, Naomasa responded moving forward next to Mirai as Toshi leant back on the front of the larger desk. The departments and heroes are still going through the files, accounts and physical stacks of cash they seized. That's just an initial summary. An initial summary this. Toshinori felt his eyes widened again as he looked at the already insane number on the pad. Too much. Night Eye spoke up releasing a sigh, as the carefully laid plan they had to cripple all for one's empire had turned into what looked like a death blow. We didn't anticipate this, although in hindsight I should have factored in how much damage we had already done. They must have been consolidating resources to restructure after Yokohama. So in essence we just got very lucky, Toshinori looked from the pad to his sidekick, releasing a chuckle, finding it funny that even after all his years as a hero sometimes the biggest successes just come down to luck. I wouldn't call it that, Naomasa's voice was subdued and he shared a knowing look with Night Eye as the two shifted. Why, Toshinori felt himself frowning as his two closest allies in the world, 
seemed more defeated than jubilant at the blow they had just struck. Because although I know all for one will have more resources, the man has been operating for who knows how long, this amount of money is. Mirai paused as he struggled for a second to find the right words for the magnitude of what they had done, is beyond crippling, this is going shatter not only his empire but his control of the underworld. We aren't prepared for that. It's also going to force all for one to respond. Naomasa lent his voice to Night Eye's case causing Toshi to shift focus to the detective. So he's going to retaliate. Toshi felt his burrow furrow, disliking that their success was going to cause more danger not less. No, he's going to draw you somewhere and kill you. Naomasa responded shifting as he saw All Might fix, for all his talk, All for One is a crime boss, and they all need the same two things to keep control. Fear and money, we just shatter both of those, so the only way for him to regain any control is to key. To kill me, Toshi responded, his voice was calm and even more so than his usual simple bravery which caused Naomasa's eyes to widen in confusion but Night Eyes to narrow as a sudden realization dawned on him. You knew, Night Eyes whisper caused both Toshinori and Naomasa to turn to him as the sidekick felt himself go pale. Naomasa, please could give us a few moments, Toshinori just put the pad down on the large desk behind him as he looked at the police detective. I. Naomasa trailed off as he looked at Sir Night Eye and then back to the symbol of peace, before just giving a nod. I'll go see how the cleanup is going. Neither of the heroes spoke until they heard not only Naomasa leave but the great grinding gears of the might gate halt sealing them in the office. Toshinori for a moment felt as if he should turn into his muscle form and deal with what was about to happen from a position of strength. However, he resisted that urge, Mirai wasn't a villain to be beaten or a self-serving bureaucrat to be ignored he was his best friend and sidekick. Mirai just took a deep breath before. You knew the raids were going to yield more than myself and Naomasa anticipated, Toshi saw his sidekick adjust his glasses as he spoke, a sign the man was beyond angry but staying in control for the moment, didn't you? Yes, I held back some of the information I uncovered, Toshi didn't see the point in lying. He had worked this idea out the moment Naomasa had started to uncover all for one's finances, although, I didn't expect this. Not this amount, but yes I knew it would be a lot more than you believed. And you knew it would be enough to force all for one's hand. And you knew I would say we're not ready, Mirai felt himself losing control as he readjusted his glasses again feeling his heart starting to beat faster. You want him to try and kill you. Why, we aren't ready. This wasn't the plan, we still have a dozen villains we are tracking and you haven't even looked at a successo. I am not passing it on, Toshinori's words cut clean through Mirai's anger as he felt himself go even paler. I am going to face him with one for all and I am going to end this. Toshi, Mirai just opened and closed his mouth not sure what words if any could come to him. Why, why not tell me, we could have planned this toge. Because this needs to end. I feel it, I feel it inside of me, I have never felt this strong, I am at my peak and I can this end but only if I face him now. Toshinori pushed himself from the desk he was leaning on and stood in front of his friend. And I know you wouldn't agree, I know you would have pushed back, convinced me to stay the course, chip away, keep the public safe, find a successor, train them and then fight him. Yes, because that has been the plan and it will work. Mirai moved forward closer to his idol and friend meeting his eye, hoping he could still get him off this path he had set himself on. It won't, Toshinori winced as he snapped at his friend releasing a sigh before placing a hand on Mirai's shoulder. It won't, all for one has hunted down every other wielder of this power except for me, why? Quote dot dot dot, because he's afraid, Mirai felt his heart sink as he could see what All Might's plan was and he hated that his friend was right. He's afraid that you can beat him. Yes, which is why we will never be able to face him on our terms. Toshinori pushed squeezing his friend's shoulder a little as he leaned over a little to look his friend in the eye who now trying to avoid his gaze. I might be able to beat him right now, but in a year. In five, in ten, after I pass on one for all. I don't know, all for one has time on his side, he was going to avoid confronting me until he was sure he would win. So you forced his hand, Mirai released a sigh as he raised his head and met his friend's warm gaze. 
forced him into a situation where he had to confront you or else lose control of everything he built. Toshi just gave a nod to his friend as he released his shoulder before standing back up to his full height and allowing one for all to flow through him causing his muscle form to appear. Night Eye couldn't help but smile as he saw All Might's beaming smile lighting up the room as he outstretched a fist towards his sidekick, who could feel the power and energy coursing through it. And when he does come for me, I promise you with this fist, I will finish it and create a world where everyone can smile. Mirai didn't say a word just met All Might's beaming powerful smile with a tender small one of his own, as he fought back the worry bounding in his chest. Even without foresight, he could see what was going to happen next. All for one would feel his grip on the underworld starting to slip as All Might pressed his advantage from today. The monster would send whoever he had left to spare to try and soften up All Might and then. Then All Might would be drawn or lured somewhere somewhere that all for one could control everything, somewhere out of the way so the monster wouldn't reveal himself to the world, so he could maintain his power in the shadows. Then the two would fight, and only one would walk away. I only hope you're right Toshi, Mirai felt his smile waver for a second as All Might gave him a nod, turned around to pick up the pad and moved to sit at his desk so they could plan their next move. Because you are risking everything on this one shot, all Might for his part never saw the waver in his friend's smile or the flash of worry on his face as he sat down, his focus for a moment went to the few framed photos on his desk. Each one was a reminder to keep pushing himself forward, to keep going to see this through to the end. One was of Gran Torino and him training together at Ua, although that was tucked away in the back, a second was of his mentor, she floating in the air and smiling down at the camera, a third was him and Mirai together on their first public outing as a team. However, as he looked them over his eyes darted to the top drawer of the desk on his right, he fought the urge to open it as he knew what was in it, that drawer had only one item in it. However, although he resisted the urge to open it and refocused on his sidekick as the two started to talk about what to do next now that the raids had succeeded he felt another urge echoing in the back of his head. An urge he had felt constantly for years now but was now thundering in his skull as the end of the road of his mission was starting to loom large on the nearing horizon. He kept it at bay long enough that his conversation had ended with Mirai and the man had left to check on Naomasa before slumping into his seat his smile falling away. He didn't even notice that his hand had opened the forbidden drawer and removed the slightly dusty framed photo of a couple smiling and laughing with each other at a picnic that seemed lifetimes ago now. This could be it, I should reach out, I should. Toshi fought down the urge with every ounce of strength of will he had in him as he quickly but very carefully put the framed photo of Inko and himself back into the drawer before quickly shutting it. He had to stay focused, he had to remain on task, and he had struck the first blow of what he hoped would be the final battle. He could afford to think about. Single quote dot dot dot. I should see her one last time, I should, I should say goodbye. Midoriya Apartment. Musudafu. Japan five years ago, late June. Carry the remainder over to the second column, which should equal the combined revenue from circulation for the second quarter. Inko was hunched over the desk in her room as she put the last pieces of the puzzle together only to groan in frustration. Only they don't, most be something in the marketing budget then, as salary and circulation work out. Ah, this is going to take forever. Inko lifted her hand and took another slice of cake into her mouth. The rich chocolate goodness soothed her dread of staring at numbers for the rest of the day. She released a sigh and sat up stretching herself as she did so, the act however caused her to frown a little, as she looked down at her body. She wasn't self-deluded enough to ignore that she had gained more than a little weight over the past few years and that her somewhat slender figure was a bit more round. The thought caused her to frown and she automatically reached for another slice of cake, however, she withdrew her hand quickly when she saw what she was doing. She knew she should cut back on the comfort food that had become her unhealthy escape from stress and worry, and largely she had been successful. But she knew she should be doing more. What she should do was cut more out of her meals, maybe go on a diet or even join that gym that Mitsuki keeps suggesting. However, just as those thoughts entered her head they were immediately pushed to one side as a figure appeared in the doorway who was the source of worry and stress. Mom, where do you want this? Izuku's question was in reference to the two large boxes he was struggling to carry, 
her eyes couldn't help but glance at the small bruises and scars on his arms. Oh baby, just put them at the foot of my bed, I'll sort them out. Inko stood up and almost rushed into her son to help him trying to take one of the boxes from him. Mom, I had that, Izuku beeped as he failed to prevent her from taking the top box, but managed to place the second one down before she could grab it. Oh, I know baby, I just... Inko trailed off as she tried not to look at her son with worry again, seeing he felt low that she had helped him again, I just wanted to help. Her eyes darted to his arms again, the bruising and cuts were nothing new and she felt the urge to grab another slice of cake again. She and everyone else knew Izuku was being bullied at school and that it was only getting worse the older he got. She had done everything to protect her son, talked to teachers constantly, made reports to the school board, gone to the Ministry of Education to complain, and even threatened the school at one point with legal action. All of which had amounted to nothing, she had been politely ignored by the school board, the teachers had given excuses and any one official had just never got back to her. Her boy was at the top of his class academically, he was also kind, helpful and naturally athletic, in another age Izuku would have thrived at school. Although he didn't look like Toshi, Izuku had clearly inherited his father's body type, each year his physique started to resemble Toshi's a little more. He was the second tallest kid in his class, there was one mutant type student who was just huge, but Izuku beat everyone else by a good few inches and despite only turning 9 next month he was soon going to be taller than her. He had placed second in all of the sports trails for his year beaten only by Katsuki and found that he didn't have to try very hard to keep in shape. He was naturally fast, strong and if someone was willing to help probably would dominate any sport he wanted to pick up. However, none of that mattered, because he was quirkless. Anytime Izuku did anything good, it was ignored, anytime he succeeded, it was mocked that everyone else was being handicapped, anytime he did anything it was made a joke. She had tried to be a wall between the harshness of the world and her son but little by little it had worn her down, she found herself just fighting the same battles every day and getting nowhere. Her Izuku was suffering but he was putting on a brave face and she knew he wasn't telling her even a tenth of things that were happening to him at school or afterwards. She had spent a fortune replacing damaged books and clothing, she wished she could do more but she just couldn't and it was killing her. I know, Izuku replied, giving his mother a clearly fake smile before he turned and left the room, his shoulders slumping slightly, as his voice dropped a little. I know. She opened her mouth to say something to ask him about his day to lighten the mood or if that failed to discuss his birthday that was coming up next month. However, both topics died before she could voice them, the former would just result in him lying to her about whatever had happened and the latter would lead to awkwardness. When he was little Izuku's birthday although never large had attracted at least a few attendants, principally his old childhood friend Katsuki, but every passing year fewer people attended. A few years ago she had to start coming up with trips for the two of them to go on for his birthday as not a single person had replied to his invites. So she was just forced to watch her son retreat from her, her heart aching as her mind failed to come up with anything to help him. What made it worse was that he was only turning 10 and the world was already starting to grind him down and no one apart from her seemed to care. She also knew it was only going to get worse. When he started looking at schools in a few years his condition was going to limit his options. She was dreading those days and after that he would be looking at jobs or higher education, that she knew from experience would be even more ruthless. When she had been looking at her first job, her very weak quirk had closed a lot of doors and only her academic skill had made up the difference. The world revolved around quirks, even if the job you wanted had nothing to do with it having the right one open doors, not having, well she didn't want to dwell on that. As she left her office wanting a break from work she quickly spied into her son's room, as he had left the door ajar. He was laid on his bed, that in a few years would be far too small for him, and like always she saw he was writing in one of his notebooks. Izuku's room was largely bare, he had his own desk with a laptop with the desk's inbuilt shelf stacked with volume after volume of his own handwritten notebooks. She had no doubt if things were a little different he would have plastered it floor to ceiling in hero-worshipping posters, action figures and other memorabilia. She had never truly relented on her no-hero talk in the apartment and Izuku had never pushed her on it, 
but she knew if she opened a drawer of the desk or looked under his bed she would discover a trove of forbidden items. Despite never saying it she knew that he still dreamed of becoming a pro hero, of swapping in and saving the day with a smile on his face. Would I let him? Inko froze at the thought as her eyes lingered on her son who was oblivious to her watching him, she found her hand going to the faded scar on her cheek. If he had a quirk, would I stand in his way? Would I deny him his dream? I saw what that world was like, the real harsh reality of it, the Dan. A phone call is here. A phone call is here. A phone call is here. Inko for a second thought that the electronic voice of All Might was coming from her son's room, that it was his new ringtone. However, it took all of a few seconds for her to remember Izuku didn't have a cell phone yet and that he hadn't moved at all so it couldn't be one of his toys that he kept hidden. As All Might's voice kept blurting out, her eyes widened as she realized where it was coming from. She saw Izuku lower his notebook confusion on his face as he heard the strange ringtone. She moved like lightning as she rushed back into her small room and launched herself at the box under her bed. She had largely forgotten that she had the box as it was all the stuff from her time working at the Might Tower and with him. She quickly found the cell phone that was making the noise, it had been a gift after the relationship had become serious. She had originally thought the ringtone was a joke about where they worked so had never bothered to change it. She would have frowned that it still worked, as she hadn't charged it in a decade, knowing who had got it for her it was probably some advanced model that didn't need charging or something else complicated. However, she didn't have time to ponder that as Izuku's voice sounded out from her door. Mom is everything okay? Izuku gave her door a knock and a little push but she again moved like lightning as she pressed herself against the door to prevent him from coming in and seeing both the phone and her box. Oh yes sweetie, nothing wrong, Inko managed to sound normal as she muted the phone that was still ringing. Just watching um, a video a friend sent. Okay, Izuku's voice sounded a little worry but accepting nonetheless, I'll be in my room if you need anything. Love you. Love you too. Inko stated back waiting to hear her son move off before looking back at the phone that was silently buzzing in her hands. She looked at the number but didn't recognize it and was feeling the urge to just let it ring out and then get rid of the phone. It was likely a wrong number anyway or a scam caller who got the number by dialing randomly. Anyway, she had put this part of her life firmly in the past, far behind, she had moved on, she had a new life, a job, friends, her son. She never thought about it at all and she didn't need to. Hello. Inko blinked as she found that she had answered the phone, pressing it to her ear without thinking, she held her breath expecting to hear his voice again. Hello is this Inko Haikatsuga? The voice caused Inko to blink it was a woman her tone was polite and respectful. Uh, speaking, Inko shifted as she moved further into her bedroom, finding it odd being called by her old name and had no idea who the woman was. Sorry. Who is this? My name is Aiko, I'm calling from Hiringu Private Hospital in Tokyo. We apologize for the abrupt call but you are listed as the emergency contact for Toshinori Yagi, the woman's tone was respectful but laced with a hint of somberness that caused Inko to feel her heart drop as a chill went up her spine. We are sorry to inform you that he has been admitted with multiple severe injuries and is currently in a critical condition. As per private instructions in his medical records, we are contacting you to let you know. WHWH, Inko felt her brain stop working for a few seconds as her mind tried to catch up with what she was being told, all of which made no sense. What do you mean critical condition? Is he going to be alright? What injuries? Emergency contact. Inko's mind threw up the question as she started to catch up with the first piece of news that shocked her system but once she could guess the answer to. He never got around to changing it, oh god I think he is still down as mine. Mr. Yagi is undergoing multiple surgeries by the best doctors available, we even have several pro heroes with healing quirks who have offered their assistance. Inko felt herself collapse as the woman spoke knowing that the woman was trying to be positive before delivering something awful. However, I must be honest with you his condition is not great, his respiratory system is severely damaged and his stomach is not ideal either. He isn't expected to survive the night. If you want to see him I would advise coming as soon as possible. 
Inko felt her heart freeze at the words her mind conjuring up a nightmare she had for a while after she figured out Toshi was all might that had played out exactly like this. However, there was no waking moment to discover it was all in her head and that he was next to her in bed, no comforting smile or stroke of the cheek to banish her fears. She sat in silence for a few moments not saying a word as she took in the news that although had once been her greatest fear she had never truly believed for a second would happen. Toshi was all might for heaven's sake, he was unstoppable, unbeatable, he was invincible, but he's not, he never was you know that. The woman on the phone didn't say a word or try to push for any type of response and just waited for Inko to be ready. I'll be there as swiftly as I can. Inko blinked as she found herself saying the words that her head hadn't actually agreed to yet but a deep corner of her heart had thrown out before it could be stopped. Dd do I have to um, bring, bring anything. No ma'am, I am sending you a text to the number we called, it has our address, when you arrive just ask for Mr. Yagi's room. Any issues just show them the text message, it will have an ID code at the end. Again we are very sorry for the news and wish you all the best. Inko found herself moving on autopilot, she waited for the text before she became a blur of motion, leaving her room, grabbing her purse, and a coat, and getting a very Izuku ready and out of the apartment. As they exited their apartment block and suddenly stopped, her nearly ten-year-old son just gave her a little worried look as she just stared at him not moving. Her mind had just caught up with everything and she suddenly realized she hadn't actually decided what to do with her son. Do I take him with me? That would mean telling him. Tell him what though, his father isn't overseas but in a hospital in Tokoyo only a few hours away. Then what? Tell him who his father really is. Inko put an awkward smile on her face as she looked at Izuku who just shifted and gave his own awkward smile back. No, 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 can't do that not yet, what if this turns out to be a mistake? Artoshi isn't that hurt. Or, or, or. Izuku, we, I, Inko knew she had to decide something quickly or her incredibly smart boy would start asking questions and she wasn't sure she wouldn't just blurt out answers she wasn't ready to give. You're going to stay over at the Bakugos for a little while. There's been a, an incident with a family member, a distant one I just need to go see them is all. A family member, Izuku asked. His burrow furrowing is apart from his mother he had never met or heard of any other relatives apart from his dad who worked overseas. Are they all right? Oh yeah, they're fine it's a cousin of mine. She took his hand as she answered and started to walk in the direction of the bus stop so she could drop him off with Mitsuki and her husband. Just need to go see them, it's just there in Tokyo so I might be a little late coming back. Izuku seemed to frown a little at her answer but thankfully he didn't press her for any more details and just accepted the story. It took them less than an hour to reach the Bakugo's house, luckily Inko managed to call ahead when they were on the bus so it seemed a little more planned when Mitsuki and her husband greeted them at the door. Izuku gave them a very polite bow and only winced a little when his old playmate Katsuki just huffed at having him stay over but said nothing, clearly his mother had already laid into him not to make a scene. Mitsuki's husband Masaru took Izuku into the house after he gave his mom a hug to get settled, leaving the two women alone for a moment. Inko what's happening? Mitsuki's eyes followed Izuku until he was out of earshot before asking the question, knowing something had to be very wrong for her to just drop her son on them. Quote dot dot dot, it's Izuku's father, Inko replied, her friend's eyes widening at the statement. Mitsuki despite knowing the most out of everyone about Izuku's parentage still basically knew nothing apart from vague statements she made over the years. He's in hospital it's apparently bad. Oh god, does Izuku know? Mitsuki shifted asking the question knowing this was a very delicate topic for her friend. No, I want to see him first and if it is. Inko felt her heart drop again as her mind was just conjuring up the worst possible scenarios, she found she just couldn't a sentence at the moment. Could I ask, if it turns out to be bad could you? You just text or call me, I'll bring him up, Mitsuki answered the non-asked question without hesitation. Thank you, I'll call when I know more, Inko gave her friend a hug, which normally the fiery woman would complain about but for once didn't push the issue. Inko just took a deep breath and gave one last glance at Izuku over her friend's shoulder before turning around and heading out to face complete uncertainty. 
She was fidgeting every few seconds as she fought the urge to eat something as her mind summoned up all the scenarios it could. However, mostly she just prayed to anyone and anything that would listen that her tea that Toshi was fine and this was all just a mistake. Hiring new private hospital, Tokyo, Japan five years ago, late June. It wasn't. Inko was as still as a stone statue as she looked down at the still unconscious muscled figure on the bed before her. She said figure because what was before her hardly looked like a person let alone a man or even remotely like Toshi. There were more wires, tubes and machines hooked up to him than she thought possible, nearly all of them going into his left side which looked more like a crater than anything close to a human torso. That wasn't even mentioning the bandages, he was covered in so many that he looked like he was being mummified for burial, the only visual sign it was Toshi was that his face was uncovered. However, that appeared to be only a result of necessity as a breathing tube and mask were fixed over his face. She reached out a hand to touch him but stopped herself just as she was about to stroke his forehead, remembering that the doctor had told her not to disturb him in any way. Instead, she just lowered her hand back down to her side, her eyes taking in the sight that so matched the nightmares and fears she had had for years. For a second, her mind flashed an image of not Toshi before her but Izuku, battered bloody, dying. No, she shook that image away quickly focusing on the fact that Izuku was quirkless for all the harm it did him at least kept him from this fate. She just refocused on Toshi, she wished the room was silent so that she could think clearer but every device he was hooked up to made a different sound, that wasn't including the beeping monitors each one tracking a different part of Toshi's crumbling anatomy. She wasn't sure how long she stood there looking at the man who still conjured up powerful feelings inside her despite all her efforts. She just watched the steady rise and fall of his chest the only indication she truly had that the machines were indeed keeping him alive. Oh I'm sorry dear, I didn't think anyone was in here, Inko blinked as she turned to see a very short elderly woman with grey hair styled into a netted bun with a large syringe poking diagonally out of it to the left. I just need to check on his vitals, don't mind me at all. The woman was clearly a pro hero given the costume she was wearing, it constituted of a doctor's lab coat and a dress with yellow and red vest like designs on either side, two yellow buttons, and a belt with a pink, R, shaped buckle. She wore bright pink boots and had a helmet around the sides of her head, with a purple tinted visor joining it over her eyes. In addition, she was walking with a cane designed like a syringe that she was evidently supporting herself on. The woman was a consummate professional, she didn't glance at Inko, ask who she was and just got on with her job. She double-checked every single monitor and device, as she pulled out a pad from her coat pocket and started typing down the results, her face revealed nothing to Inko about Tashi's state. She just watched the woman work, Thankful she finally had something else to focus on other than Tashi's complete lack of movement or sign of life. Quote dot dot dot, is he going to live? Inko finally whispered the question as the elderly pro hero finished her last check on her patient. Yes, he's going to live, the woman replied giving Inko a warm smile although afterwards, she released a sigh clearly indicating that his survival was going to be complicated. He's far too stubborn to die, far too stubborn. Although what state he will be in I cannot say, his body has taken a lot of damage. When will he whack? Inko edged a little closer to the bed still resisting the urge to touch Toshi but feeling a weight lifting off her chest at the news he would survive. What are you doing here? Inko froze as the harsh cold blunt voice cut her off, as she turned to see Toshi's sidekick Sir Night Eye present. Really Mirai is that any way to behave in a hospital or speak to a lady? The woman stepped forward before Inko could say anything to defend herself, the woman wielded her syringe cane as if she was going to smack him. It's alright, I get that me being here is a shock. Inko spoke up before Mirai could say anything himself, her eyes darting from him to the elderly pro hero, could you leave us alone for a few moments please? Very well, the woman just gave her a little nod before shuffling her way to the door, as she passed Night Eye she whispered something Inko didn't manage to hear. Don't do anything stupid Mirai. The two just stood in silence for a few moments as Mirai looked from Inko to Toshinori, his usually stoic features cracking as concern and worry flashed across his face as he looked at his injured friend. However, although the concern didn't leave his eyes his face fell into a frown as he looked back at Inko his eyes raking over her. 
She had changed in the decades since he last saw her. She had gained weight, and she looked more than a little run down but she was undeniably Inko Haikatsuga. Her emerald green eyes and hair were unmistakable. The two looked at each other as Mirai moved fully into the room so he was standing next to her by Toshinori's bed, the pro hero sidekick was the first to break the silence. What are you doing here Inko? Mirai's voice wasn't quiet accusatory but neither was it anywhere close to friendly. I'm apparently still his emergency contact. Toshi never changed them, Inko's words caused Myra's frown to deepen his eyes narrowing at her but as he glanced at Toshi again it was clear he believed her. When he was admitted, it was in his files to call me. What happened? The villain, the one who sent those goons that night. Toshi finally managed to flush him out into the open. Mirai just sighed as he brought a hand up to his eyes rubbing them at the less than ideal situation his friend had created. The idiot knew it was a trap and walked right into it. He won though. One, one. Inko couldn't help herself as she felt rage and anger build up in at the stupid priority that engulfed heroes, the selfless sacrifice that Toshi embodied, the very thing that had driven her away. He's in a coma with half his chest gone. You call that winning? I know. Mirai snapped back his own rage bursting out, but his anger was clearly not about Inko or her statement as he glanced at his injured friend again. I know, I know, but he's alive and with time can live a mostly normal life now, after he retires. Retires, Inko said the word her eyes widening as she glanced at Toshi herself her eyes raking over his shattered body. Retired, the word caused an intrusion of images racing through her head. Toshi meeting Izuku, the of them two talking again, her helping and looking after him, the three of them living together out of the limelight now that the world wasn't obsessed with him, now that he didn't have to. He won't. Inko whispered the response her eyes just staying on the man that her heart still ached for, knowing the truth. Of course he will, he can't continue like this, Mirai replied a little too quickly as he shifted a little as she looked at him his own concern flashing across his face. He will, it's, it's, dot who he is, Inko closed her eyes as she felt her heart sink again, knowing what Toshi would do, her mind echoing what her heart was felling. It's why we love him, it's why we couldn't stay. You could stay, Mirai's words caused her to blink as she looked up at the man whose eyes were still fixed on his injured friend before turning to her an almost pleading look there. He, he, we could convince him together. Grand Tranio is here too, the three of us could convince him to re- Use foresight, Inko's voice was suddenly hard and firm as she looked away from Mirai turning to face Toshinori fully. What? Mirai felt a shiver go down his spine as he knew exactly why she had said those words. I know what your quirk is, I know you can see the future, Inko just stayed looking at Toshi, her heart was beating faster and faster in her chest, however. I know it's never wrong, so use it, see what he will do and tell me, tell me there is still hope. Mirai didn't say a word as he looked at her and then to his friend, his mind was racing as he felt everything all at once. His fear of using his quirk in case it created a fixed future, the uncertainty of the future itself in this moment, the worry for his friend's life, and how the world would react to All Might's retirement. All of it hit him at once but he didn't show any of it as he moved forward, he placed a gentle hand on his friend's exposed hand that wasn't bandaged, the act caused All Might's eyes to flutter open just enough so he could use his quirk. Hoping to see a brighter future than the one he feared. It only took moments for Inko to receive her answer. As Mirai's face just grew paler and paler, she saw a tear rolling down his face before suddenly he ripped his hand away breaking the connection his quirk needed. The sidekick's face was one of pure horror and terror as he almost hyperventilated right in front of her. His eyes lingered on Toshi for another second before they moved and met hers, the look present told her everything she needed to know. Quote dot dot dot, we can change it though, we have to, Mirai's voice for the first time was just broken and lacked all confidence hope or resolve as he pleaded with her, I can't let him, I can't let him die. Inko didn't respond to him, she just turned to Toshinori, although her face didn't show it her heart was again tearing itself apart, her angle meant that Mirai couldn't see the tears she was forcing away. She just leaned down and planted a single kiss on his forehead, the only thing she found she could do. As she stood up she took a deep breath before turning and leaving the room, she hated herself at this moment but she knew she had to leave. Toshi would never change, 
he could never change, and he would run head first into danger until it killed him. It was why she loved him and she would stay with him up until the end but she and Izuku wouldn't change that, in fact learning he had a kid would probably just make Toshi work 10,000% times harder to make the world safer for him. She wasn't the priority in her life anymore, that spot belonged to her boy and she would be damned if she let him watch his father kill himself. Possibly inspire the boy who was just as selfless as Toshi to risk his own life trying to follow his footsteps. He didn't even have a quirk, if her Izuku learned any of this, he would just get himself killed following the path she had just seen the end of. No, she would be a wreck entirely and hate herself forever but she would keep her distance and keep her son safe. As she left Mirai just collapsed onto the floor his head in his hands as he tried to think of a way to change the future, both of them missed Tashi's semi-conscious mumble as he fought to live. Quote dot dot dot, Inko, to be continued. I hope you enjoyed this story. Also remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.